Uh, so I always like to start with a question. Here's the question. What is your go-to comfort food snack? Sweet or salty? How many would say sweet is your go-to? Maybe about 30%. How many of you say salty is your go-to? Yeah, you obviously have the right answer. Salty <laughs> is the snack to go. I, that happened to me just this past week. Someone in our house purchased a very large bag of popcorn from probably from Costco, and it had like the perfect combination of butter and salt, and I just kept filling a bowl and then eating it and then filling another one. I lost track of how many, but I mean, it's popcorn, so it's pretty light and fluffy. It's probably not many calories in it. It's fine. Until I was probably at like bowl six or seven, I don't know. Someone looked at the bag and said, hey, where did all this go? And since there's only three of us in our house, it was very hard to keep that a secret. Um, why do you think eating some kind of food brings comfort in that moment? Why is it? What is it about food that just brings us some level of comfort? And especially sometimes you can just get into mindless eating. I'm guilty of that as much as anybody. Well, today as we continue our conversation on unobvious idols, I want to address food. And so we're going to have some fun today. Last week we addressed screens and phones and I think it was Monday, our youngest daughter, Alyssa, she said, Dad, I kind of hated that message. <laughs> I was like, why? She said, well, I deleted a bunch of apps off my phone, and now my life is so boring. <laughs> There's nothing to do. And I said, well, maybe that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I don't know. Might be. <laughs> We're going to talk about food, though, and I want to just give you some questions to think about. What if the things we turn to for comfort or, or satisfaction like food, I think it represents something more than that. What if they're just temporary solutions to a spiritual need that only Jesus can fill? Maybe to simplify that question, what are you using to satisfy a hunger only Jesus was meant to fill? And so food is at the surface, but I think we're going to look a little bit deeper what's underneath it. But I think it's important to talk about food. So if you're taking notes, I'd encourage you to write this down. Number one, here's where we're going to start. That food is a gift from God. You can go the whole way back to Genesis. God says, I have given you every seed bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. Now, in case you're wondering if God was telling everyone to be vegetarians, he also gave the people of Israel both bread called manna and quail, which was meat to eat. And there were many, yes, someone said. There were sacrifices, there were animal sacrifices that God required, but then they were able to eat. And for many of those, they were able to eat that meat. And so God gave us this gift called food. And he's the provider. I mean, even part of the Lord's prayer is, give us today the food we need, our daily bread. And so that includes physical feud, uh, food, not feud. <laughs> the Lord is our provider. When was the last time you truly stopped and just said, God, thank you for being my provider? Not just saying grace before a meal, but just acknowledging the Lord as your provider for all the good things you enjoy in life. Food is God's gift to us. Food is also fuel. We know that it, we need food to stay alive. It's essential. It's a necessity. We are given one body to steward on this earth. And there's lots of information out there to eat a healthy diet, build a good sleep habit, keep your body active. So we're not gonna spend a lot of time on that today, but it's about stewarding the body that we have. But a little bit deeper than that is, and as I was putting this message together, man, I was so convicted because I just look at internally and say, okay, I wanna recognize how often do I look to food for some kind of comfort or entertainment or even a distraction. The table is also a gift, right? The table represents a shared experience on how to build relationships with other people. Now, I was fortunate to grow up in a home where the table was very central as a priority in our home. So just about every night, here's my memory as a kid, even from the youngest that I can remember, our Practice was each night there would be a table set, there'd be food on the table, and we would sit down and 
eat and face each other. I have two older brothers, so there's five of us, and we would just eat and face each other. And I remember being so jealous of my friends who said that they got to watch TV as they were eating their meal. I was like, man, why can't I? But I didn't really appreciate the gift that my parents gave me. Something's interesting, though, when I think back. All those meals that we had, I don't remember one specific conversation. I don't really remember the topics of conversation. My parents didn't use that time to reprimand us or correct us. They did not use it for family devotions. Maybe they read devotions at some point, but I don't remember it. But do you know what I do remember? We just ate and we engaged in small talk. And I would argue that it's small talk that compounds into deep relationship. Small talk, it opens the door to what I'll call soul talk, where you truly get to know one another. And so I didn't realize, realize it at the time, but my parents gave me such a gift of the table being an opportunity to have the shared experience where you're learning how to build relationships with other people. And I was taught to listen and be listened to. And I would say that one parenting decision by my parents probably influenced my view of the home more than anything else that they did. The table. The table is called out in scripture. You read Acts chapter two, the end of that, it, it highlights the practices of the early church. And the early church, were, they were committed to four practices. Sound doctrine, being committed to sound doctrine, prayer, fellowship, and eating together. You know, eating together is scriptural. So think about that. Eating together is in, on the same, in the same list, the same category as prayer and sound doctrine. It's biblical. The table, food is God's gift. And so let's look underneath it a little bit. Am I eating then just to nourish my body? This is a good question to ask. Am I eating to nourish my body or am I looking for something else? Maybe it is comfort, distraction, relief from something. Food represents those things that can become idols when we look for it to satisfy something in us that only Jesus can satisfy. And I don't want us to lose sight of that. And so let's look at what scripture says about it. There's a big warning in scripture when it comes to food, but really what's underneath food and it's about cravings. And so number two, I want to encourage you to write this down, to beware the trap of overindulgence. Beware the trap of overindulgence. Appetites are like fires. The more you feed them, the bigger they get. So we have a fire pit in our home, and just last weekend, our, two of our kids had fall break from college, and so we just hung out at our fire pit, and it's interesting, because every time I put a log on, the fire would consume it, and then it would die down. I put another one on, and it would consume it, grow bigger, and then it would die down. Never ending. You just keep feeding it, and it would never stop. That fire would continue to consume. We were also roasting marshmallows. And you know that first marshmallow that you roast is so good. If you get just the outside of it perfectly light brown, but the inside is warm and gooey, that marshmallow is so good. But by the 20th one, <laughs> that will hurt. Now, I did not have 20 last week. But think about how overindulgence happens. Our appetites can sometimes run the show. Overindulgence is a spiritual issue. It's not just a physical one. And so food represents those earthly things that try to satisfy our human cravings. Whether it's for food, it could be for alcohol, it could be some kind of substance, it could be some kind of relationship or approval of others. These human cravings cannot be fully trusted because they are never fully satisfied. Earthly desires, earthly indulgences, they're always temporary. You never truly be able to satiate a human desire outside of Jesus. So let's get some wisdom from Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 20 says, do not carouse with drunkards 
or feast with gluttons, for they are on their way to poverty and too much sleep clothes them in rags. What's the lesson? Overindulgence in food and alcohol leads to personal and financial ruin. I think Proverbs would say you can count on it every time. How about Proverbs 25 or 16 says, do you like honey? Don't eat too much or it will make you sick. (laughs) What's the lesson? Even too much of a good thing can be harmful. How about Proverbs 27 verse 20? Just as death and destruction are never satisfied, so human desire is never satisfied. What's the lesson? Human cravings are endless and will never be satisfied by the things of this earth. So here's a good question to ask. And it's one that I had to ask myself, face the mirror before I came up here to face you. What cravings have controlled your life lately? What would you write down? Because if we try to satiate our appetite apart from God's design, it will lead us to empty and often it will lead down a path of destruction. So it's important to pay attention to your cravings. What are they? Now, I want to look at what Paul talks about. Now, he wrote a letter to a church in Corinth, and this church was dealing with a wide range of issues. Moral corruption, sexual immorality, influenced by the surrounding pagan culture. And it's very similar to ours today. So we're a church in this culture in the U.S., 2024, it's very similar. We have to be very careful as a church that we're not influenced by the culture that we live in. But instead, we can, as a church and as followers of Jesus, influence the culture around us. So Paul is writing this letter as a, as a pastor to this church, and he addresses something, this connection or correlation between food or this craving for food and sexual immorality. And I want you to see it because I think it's very, very important to understand. First Corinthians chapter six, let's start with verse 12. Paul writes, you say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. You say food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. This is true, though someday God will do away with both of them. But you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord, and the Lord cares about our bodies. And God will raise us from the dead by his power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scriptures say, the two are united into one. But the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So what did Paul conclude from this? Here was his Direction. He said, run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price So you must honor God with your body. You didn't realize we're going to talk about sex and a message regarding food. Probably didn't guess that, did you? But Paul addresses something very interesting. This common thought the Corinthians have, and I would say it's a common thought that people have today. He's talking about freedom in Christ. Again, he's addressing this to followers of Jesus, those who have brought their life under the authority of God's word And he's talking about freedom in Christ. And he's saying this freedom in Christ is actually a freedom that comes with responsibility. So he says, you say that I am allowed to do anything. But Paul said, listen, not everything is good for you. 
Some Corinthians believed that their freedom in Christ allowed them to do anything they wanted. And so Paul acknowledges that. And he says, yeah, that believers are free from the law, but not every action is going to be beneficial for your life. So what do we learn from that? True freedom does not mean just indulging in any desires that you have or any human cravings that you have. Just because it feels good, you don't have to do it. If an action leads to some kind of addiction or Paul's words, enslavement, it becomes harmful. The Corinthians, Paul calls out the Corinthians again, they believe that physical cravings like hunger were just natural. And so you just fulfill those natural cravings by eating food. And they said, they saw, uh, Paul said, you see the sexual uh, actions the same way. Just natural, so you just gotta fulfill it however you want to. And Paul makes a very important distinction. He says, your body has an eternal purpose. It wasn't designed for just to indulge in whatever your desires want. It's designed to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so that's why I think this is a really important point to bring up when, it, when we're talking about the trap of overindulgence. Because when you, we look at what God's word says about sex, sex is not just a physical act. It is a spiritual act. Sex spiritually joins two people together as one. In other words, when you have sex with someone, a supernatural act takes place. You're being united together as one just like he said, what God joins together, let no one separate. So God's design then is for sex to be between one man and one woman in the context of a covenant relationship in marriage till death do you part. And it's this miracle of marriage that leads to the miracle of procreation where children are a miracle and a gift from the Lord. And children must be protected in the womb and outside of the womb. So the whole idea of my body, my choice, that may sound good and that's the culture that we live in, but my body and my choice is not biblical. As followers of Jesus, we have freedom in Christ that comes with responsibility. Honor God with your body. And honor God by honoring another person's body. I love what Romans, what Paul writes in Romans 12. One, this may be a very familiar scripture to you. I've read it many times, but I want you to see it in light of how do we honor God with our bodies? Here's what he writes in Romans 12. One. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a holy and living sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Sometimes in church, we can just say, oh, I'm gonna give my heart to God. I'm just gonna give my heart to Jesus. And I understand what we're saying, and I probably have said that before, but Paul doesn't say just give your heart to Jesus and your intentions to Jesus. No, he said give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Do you know what your bodies include? Your eyes, what you look at. Your ears, what you hear, what you listen to, what you're taking in. Your mouth, the words that you say. Your hands, these hands Offering these hands to God as a living sacrifice, that means these hands should be used for helping people and used for healing people, not hurting them, not abusing. Offer your feet to the places that you go, bring honor to God. But how about our internal organs? How about our brains? How do we honor God with our minds, the things that we study, the things that we think about, things that we're learning? How about our stomachs? How about our sexual organs? How do we honor God with our bodies? It's every part of who we are. We just say, God, I'm offering it to you as a holy, set apart, living sacrifice. And I offer it to you because of all you have done for me. That's, Paul said, that's, the, that's truly the way to worship him. Oh, singing is good. Raising your hands is good. 
But Paul's not just talking about make sure that you raise your hands and worship. He's saying offer every part of you to God. So identify your cravings. Maybe it's food. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's a substance. Maybe it's a relationship that you're trying to gain some kind of approval from another person. Maybe it's some kind of addiction. You know why pornography is so harmful? You might say, oh, is that really sexual sin? You know why pornography is so harmful? Because you're objectifying another person to fulfill a pleasure or some kind of craving in yourself. So what is one area in your life that you may have be feeding the fire and maybe it's gotten out of control? You can begin to take control of your life, not by just more willpower, having a little bit more discipline. No, that's not the place to start. The place to start, you wanna take control of your life back again? The place to start is say, God, I need your help. And I'm here to remind you that God has given you the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. And you know what? The primary role of the Holy Spirit is helper. Not just an assistant some, somewhere that you call on when you're in a deep hole, a helper who stands right by your side and, a, and helps you in the areas that you cannot help yourself. Where in my life am I dealing with the trap of overindulgence? And what might happen if we let God fill that space instead? And that's where I want to land today, looking at number three, how Jesus is the bread that satisfies. Jesus is the bread that satisfies. Now, Kelly Mylan, I would argue, makes the best oatmeal bread. I would put it up against anyone in this, ha in this room. <laughs> Alyssa, our daughter, I will give her second place. <laughs> she makes amazing uh, honey butter rolls. But I just want you to think about fresh baked bread. It comes out of the oven. You take that and you have some olive oil, balsamic, cracked pepper, salt, dip it in there. It is so good, right? That's the bread that satisfies for a moment at least. But eventually you get hungry again. What does it mean that Jesus is the bread that satisfies, the bread of life? How does he satisfy us? And why do some people resist it? John chapter six captures this. It captures this interaction that Jesus has with a crowd of people. And it happens right after Jesus feeds the 5,000, this miracle where he takes a few loaves of bread and some fish, and he multiplies it to feed the 5,000 5, plus people. And right after this, there's this conversation that Jesus has with this same crowd. And I want to start reading uh, uh, John 6, 26. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. They replied, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? That sounds to me like they had a good heart posture towards Jesus. Right? They had this question, oh, what should we do? Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. They answered, we get a little window into their heart. Show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? Jesus just got done feeding 5,000 people with a few loaves of bread and a few fish. And they have forgotten about it in a short amount of time. What can you do? You see where their questions are. Verse 31, after all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, and again, they're downplaying what Jesus is doing. They're downplaying what Moses did. Moses was the one who gave us bread or gave our ancestors bread to eat called manna. And Jesus corrects them and he says, I tell you the truth, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. 
And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they replied, give us that bread every day. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me even though you have seen me. He calls them out. He calls them out because they started to doubt. And if you keep reading there, you'll see that the people are like, who is this guy who calls himself the bread of life or calls himself being sent from heaven? We know he, who he is. He's Joseph and Mary's son. We watched him grow up. There's nothing special about him. And the text actually tells us that they started to complain. They were offended at him and they complained about him. And they missed who Jesus was. They saw him in the flesh and they missed him because they resisted him. Jesus again interacts with them, jump down to verse 53, he says again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise that person at the last day for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. And you can imagine how even more resistant these people became because they're like, what is he teaching cannibalism? What is he even talking about? Jesus is pointing to the need to fully receive Jesus, fully receive him, just like you would absorb and eat food or drink water. And that unless you do that, you will not fully be satisfied with Jesus, fully believe in who he is, fully submit your life to him. You won't truly be satisfied this, in this life on this earth. But his words were taken literally and the people got offended. So we can't handle this with these words. Talking about eating flesh, drinking blood, can't handle it. So you jump down to verse 60. Many of his disciples says this is, uh, said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining. So he said to, to them, does this offend you? Then what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven again? See, so if you can't believe this, how are you going to believe someone ascending to heaven and returning again as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. When you talk about salvation, eternity, human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I've spoken to you are spirit and life. But some of you do not believe me. For Jesus knew from the beginning which ones didn't believe, and he knew who would betray him. Then he said, that is why I said that people can't come to me unless the Father gives them to me. At this point, I think this is really interesting, that is John 6, 66. 666. At this point, many of the, his disciples turned away and deserted him. At this point, his disciples turned away. Many of them. And Jesus turned to the 12 and asked, are you also going to leave? And Simon Peter replied, Lord, this is so powerful. Lord, to whom would we go? For you have the words that give eternal life. And I hope that I would have that perspective. If I was in that moment, I would just say, yeah, I don't quite understand everything you're saying about eating flesh and drinking blood, but where else are we gonna go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and we know you are the Holy One of God. And I wonder if I would have been there in that moment. I wonder how I would have responded. I think I would have had a lot of the questions that the crowd had. Saying, so you're saying drink your blood and eat your flesh. It's gross and not into that. Sounds weird. 
But what, what was Jesus getting at with this? He wasn't just talking about make sure you practice taking communion. He's saying, make sure that you fully believe in who Jesus is. Let him satisfy every need in your life. And so as I was thinking about this and preparing for this message, again, I've dealt with a lot of conviction this past week, thinking about, okay, over my life, what are the things that I've been looking to for satisfaction? And I look back at my 20s and my 30s especially, and I had too much of Jesus and theology. I love Jesus. I was looking for something in addition to that to bring some kind of satisfaction. Jesus and maybe a better home. Jesus and a better job, a job that was maybe more fulfilling or where I was appreciated more. And there were times that I think I bought into the live your best life, you know, Jesus is your life coach. And that's just nonsense. It's Jesus is everything we need. There's no Jesus and anything that's gonna satisfy your soul. When you think about Jesus as the true bread of life, only he can provide the lasting satisfaction that we often seek in earthly things. So feeding on Jesus then, what does that mean? It means fully trusting him, offering your bodies as a living sacrifice, relying on his sacrifice that he made on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. It's not going to anything about our effort where we can find approval before God. It's just being in this place of full humility, saying, Jesus, you're everything. No matter what happens this side of heaven, you are everything. And allow him to sustain you spiritually. So I would ask the question and give you a moment to think about, are you satisfied by Jesus alone as the bread of life. Whenever you feel some kind of craving, and I didn't do that this week. When I started eating popcorn, I didn't think about, oh, Jesus is my bread of life. Nope, I was just thinking about eating popcorn, another bowl and another bowl. And so I was very convicted about that. I'm like, why? I wasn't even hungry. I was just mindlessly eating this. What is it about our cravings that sometimes we do mindlessly? Popcorn, kind of low stakes, but there are some higher stakes things where our cravings take us down a, a wrong, harmful path. How can we be truly satisfied by Jesus alone? So I'm just gonna give you a couple questions to think about. What are you looking to for satisfaction? Maybe ask yourself, what am I really hungry for? Am I satisfied by Jesus alone? What would that look like in your life? And if there are some changes that need to be made, maybe the Holy Spirit's bringing some conviction. Listen, I'm just saying, join the club, man. I've been experiencing that as well. But it's good. It's when, when you know there's conviction in your life and in your heart, it's like the Spirit of God is actively working in your life. Man, be thankful for that. The last thing we would want is to not be able to be tuned in to the voice of the Spirit, drawing our hearts closer to Jesus. And so if the Lord is highlighting something in your life, man, be thankful for that. That tells me you have a soft heart. Don't let it get hard. This world will off, always offer quick fixes. You got a craving, here's a quick fix. Jesus offers something so much better, fulfilling, be satisfied. He offers himself. Take a moment to think about these questions. Maybe write them down this week. And again, the starting point is not, oh, I'm just gonna try harder. I need more discipline or I need more willpower. It's not that, it's not the starting point. Starting point is saying, God, I need your help. I need your help. Teach me how to be fully satisfied in you. Not Jesus and anything, just Jesus. So God, we offer ourselves to you today. Forgive us for those times when we look to some other things. It's human. 
I pray that we would have spiritual wisdom and understanding. You would open our eyes to see. Not buy into what our culture says life is about. But go back to your word. It teaches us, corrects us. It's living, it's active. It forms us, strengthens us, and gives us the courage to obey. So I thank you for that. Thank you that you're for us, you're not against us. But you want us to see how you've designed life on this earth. When we follow it, on the other side of that is the greatest level of peace and joy, purpose that only comes from you. And so we're grateful for that promise. I don't want to dismiss without giving you an opportunity. If you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity right now. We just heard and read about Jesus being the bread of life. And maybe you're here today and your life feels a little bit empty and you've been trying to fill it with something. Or maybe it actually feels satisfied and you're trying to satisfy it with different things in your life. Maybe it's relationship. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it is alcohol or sex or food. Something other than Jesus. You've been trying to fill that void. And you want to make this decision to follow Jesus. You're like, well, I just got to clean all this up. And Jesus said, no, don't, don't wait. Just come as you are. And he gives this invitation to every person, no matter how old you are, whether you've been in church all your life or whether you're new and you're just exploring what faith is, he gives this invitation to come just as you are and allow Jesus to transform your life. See, when you place your faith in him, like these people were wondering, how, how, what does it mean? Eat your flesh, drink your blood. What does that even mean? So when you come to Jesus, you put your faith in him, there's gonna be a satisfaction from that that is just so different than everything else in this world. So there's no more striving. And so I just want to give you that opportunity. If you're ready to say, God, I surrender. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I want to lead you in a prayer. And it's just a simple prayer, but it's a prayer of decision. And when you believe it, it's going to change your life. So if you're ready to pray that, would you just bow your heads? And I'm going to invite everyone to repeat it out loud just so nobody's praying alone. Would you say, Heavenly Father... I thank you for Jesus. I believe he is the son of God. I believe he came to this earth, died on a cross, was buried in a tomb, and rose from the dead for me. I believe he ascended to heaven, and he will return again as the king of kings, and the Lord of Lords. So I repent of my sins, receive forgiveness for my sins, and I choose Jesus to be my Lord, my Savior, and the bread of life that truly satisfies. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can all look up. If you prayed that prayer as a decision today, again, no matter what age you are, how long you've been in church or not been in church, if you've made that decision today, the ushers have a Bible for you that we want you to have. Would you have the courage just to put your hand up in the air, unashamed, till an usher sees you, they'll hand you that Bible. And it's our way of walking with you because following Jesus, having a personal relationship with Jesus is not meant to be walked alone. And so if you've got one of these Bibles, I want to encourage you to stop by our connections rooms, either side of the auditorium. We have a team of people there that would love to talk with you and pray with you. I've, I saw a couple of hands. Can we thank God for these individuals who are making decisions? <laughs> the best decision you will make because it sets you on a new path. So after service, I want to encourage you to stop by our connections rooms. Love to, uh, for you to meet the people there that would love to talk with you and pray with you help you on your next step. And if you've made a decision to follow Jesus, your next step is to be water baptized. And so if you'd like to be baptized, you can go online, worshipcenter.org slash baptism. We have a class to go through. It'll explain what baptism is, how to write your testimony, 
understand what it is to follow Jesus and live your life with him as your Lord. So I'd encourage you, if you have not been baptized, I encourage you to take that step. It's for you. It's not for me. It's not for the church. It's for you. It's like that line in the sand. Following Jesus, no turning back. All right. Well, so good to be together today. Man, I hope you're encouraged. I hope they're challenged by God's word. If you're new to Worship Center, make sure you stop by Connections as well. If you need prayer for any reason, we'll have a prayer team down front. We'd love to pray for you. And I hope you have a great week. You can all stand. Have an amazing rest of your Sunday. Have a great week. And we'll see you here next Sunday. Have a good week.